Welcome back to the 150K Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Graham, where we help take your dreams to six figures and beyond. Today, I have with me Oliver Wolf from Beyond the Peak. Now, I met you, if I remember correctly, through our buddy Gabe Arnold. Is that correct? You got it. Yeah. So for people that don't know you and all, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and the big wolf picture picture (laughs) on the back, because I like wolves, and I see it every time I talk to you. It shows up, and that's just kind of cool. Yeah, man. Um, who I am. So I'm a proud husband, father of twin girls, Leona and Kira. Uh, so that's first and foremost, you know, front row dad is, is why that represents. Um, and aside from that, though, really on the professional side, um, I'm easily seen as sort of, you can label me as a operations wizard, operational type person. Uh, I, I play sort of a COO role in my uh, business beyond the peak and I'm a fractional CEO with other clients and so that's really where my mind's at I'm just an operational genius is where I'm about and uh, but more on like the strategic and all that kind of fun stuff right so keep me at super high level that's who I am <laughs> and the wolf though that's where it gets a little more granular for sure and it's very it's actually a very fun uh, series of stories because it's not just one but um, in its simplest form I identified with it when I was young in my like late teens but not particularly. Um, it was like, ah, oh, it feels cool, but it felt kind of like weird to talk about. And then what was hilarious is I worked at Cutco. Uh, I'm sure a lot of listeners know about Cutco. And I won an award. And at Cutco, I was starting to introduce myself as Oliver Wolf because it's not my actual name. It's my chosen name. Uh, that lead, that has a lot to do with the transformation that I went through. And it, I started to really use that. And then it was on a certificate of, for an award I got and they put Oliver Wolf. And then someone laughs like, oh, that's not his real name. And, and then they made a joke about like, oh, this is why you should put your real name. And then I was like, you know what? This is like the official, like it's on an award. This is who I am, you know? Um, so that was really cool. But then where it really, really landed, because I was still a little bit egoic, you know, still kind of an ego name-ish. Um, when, it, when it really came through is when I was in Costa Rica, I was in a sweat lodge uh full like seasonal um uh walk through i guess you could say and in the depths of it all at one point i had a wolf come right up into my face obviously as a hallucin <laughs> hallucination yeah. um and it was it looked almost exactly like the one behind me so black wolf two yellow eyes this one has a blue and a yellow but two yellow eyes black wolf came up to me and it, it was like in that moment i was like okay that was definitely my spirit animal coming right at me and and spoke so many words with just a look. Um, so anyways, there's more depth than that, but that's that's definitely the, the medium level of it all. No, that intrigues me for sure. So we're going to start at the beginning. So I love that you're a dad first. That to me is huge. Like whenever anyone says something, I'm like, I'm a husband, I'm a father. Like that's kind of, kind of, it, it means good people in my head because a lot of times sure. people are like, I, when you say that, they're like, oh, I'm businesses or I'm this or that, which is great. So I commend you for that. I have three kids, love them, <laughs> pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, but you said you're a, your zone of genius is operations. You're a COO, correct? Mm-hmm. So for people that are looking at this and trying to understand more of what, what does that mean to you? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, and so to be sure I'm clear on the question, like, what does it mean to be in CEO or what does it mean to like, what do you do as a CEO? Like what, what's the specific question? What, what, what do you do? Cause you said it was your zone of genius. So, I mean, yeah. I understand what a chief operating officer would be. I understand sure. that aspect. Most people are probably listening, but you said that was your zone of genius. So that's the part. Got that it. Out. Got it. Interesting. Like how is that a zone that of genius? Way? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Love that. Yeah. So for me, ultimately at the end of the day, like it's, it's. I have a natural ability to see the gaps in systems, operations, and efficiencies and identify the opportunities to streamline them. Um, And one of the things I tell a lot of people in terms of like how my mind thinks is I have an ability and I think most operational people do where you can like see one thing and then see the web of things it connects to. Whereas most visionaries, they'll see one thing and kind of see one path forward, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. the most powerful ability of a visionary is they're just like, they they basically ignore any other thing and it's both a superpower and a, a curse because the superpower is like anything's possible, but the curse is they take nothing else into consideration and right, expect right. everyone to follow along. Right. Yeah. But that's powerful in a lot of ways because it gets other people to like completely jump over, um, uh, you know, speed bumps and challenges because they're like, well, I don't know. Visionary says it's possible. So I guess it's possible. Um, and so, whereas for me, I'm like, I can see that vision too. Sure. And I can see the hundred other things that that touches 
and be able to think of like, what's the most effective way to get there? Not only now, but if this is something that's going to happen again, how can we systemize it so that next time we don't even need to think about it or it can be delegated or it can be automated or anything of that nature. Um, so that to me comes naturally. So you're the integrator in my head. You're the one that makes the visionaries. It's I one of, yeah. So if you, if you follow EOS, I'm the closest thing, but I, I score high on both sides. I'm higher on integrator, but I score high visionary as well, um, which has been a pretty unique opportunity. Uh, but yes, it's uh, one of the easiest ways to think about is integrator, operator, things like that. But that that makes sense because how can you see the end vision if you don't have a vision process with you? At least in my head, in my mind, I probably lean toward what well, depends on the role I'm in. Because like I, sure. I lean toward being a visionary, but with sales and sales processes and stuff, I integrate everything. So so I mm. vibe with that. How did you? I know because that whoops so just keeps making me think about it. So you <laughs> said that you you had you were in the sweat lodge, you're doing the thing, yeah. and you just had this, like you've had this epiphany throughout your life of the wolf. Sure. How, how has that affected like your world, your choices? Mm, like, love that. That's actually a great question. It. Totally, man. No, it's a great question. Cause it's actually impacted a lot. In fact, if I like turn off my camera, I don't know if anyone watches the video, but my logo for my hold co is five wolves. And it's, and each of them is looking a different direction because uh, the idea is that they're as a pack, watch each other's back and are able to focus on what's in front of them. And whatever they care about most but they also care about each other enough to cover each other right support each other so on and so forth so um yeah when i first really discovered and started connecting with wolves i read books on wolves and how they operate and how they think and how they hunt and how they live and all this kind of stuff and i really resonated with a lot of it i love the fact that you know they're a much a very intelligent hunter they're not just like aggressive jump in and, and attack they're very strategic in how they hunt i relate to that they're very uh, intentional about who's in their pack and everyone in their pack has an intentional role. Anyone who doesn't gets gets banished. I'm very intentional about my circle of friends, right? Um, the way that they can actually operate as lone wolves, but are still more powerful as a pack. Again, mm -hmm. both very true and very powerful and that I resonate with. So just a lot of these elements that I really, really identified with and then started to kind of permeate into. Oh, just muted. Sorry. I started to permeate into my life uh, accordingly. So it's actually influenced a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and now to this day, it's 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 very much who I am or that everyone I know uh, or who knows me, you know, like I, I get like this was a gift, this this background. I've got another wolf thing over here for my parents. Like everyone's like, if you're going to get something for all of get them a wolf thing, which is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but that's good. And, I, and just listening to you talk and how you think it kind of connects again with the COO aspect of seeing all the different ways things are interwoven sure. because if you think about it and I've always I'm, I'm into was not to the degree you are but I'm, I've just have been into it because mm -hmm. I've always liked that they always take care of each other they have yep. that mentality of I can yep. do stuff on my own but I'm yep. going to take care of it the right way in the process and everyone has their their role but no role is less equal which I mm -hmm. think that's mm -hmm. something that Let's talk about that. What are your thoughts on that? Because everyone always wants to be the CEO, COO, the big shot. But Love if that. you have no one that's helping you put the vision forward, you're not going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, man. I think one of my favorite things that was uh, um, only a few years ago, Discovery, is, is so I think to some degree, everyone thinks that what they want is what everyone else wants. To some degree, we we believe that. Um However, what I've found is so cool as you as you like build teams and really like coach them and so on and so forth, you discover that like there's actually someone who loves just doing admin work all day long. Like there are genuinely people who that's their zone of genius where they feel excited and totally cool about it and happy to punch in and punch out and be done with it. Someone like you and me, I mean, I don't know about you, but like for me, I would rather die, <laughs> right? Thanks. And I don't want to do admin. <laughs> exactly. And so this is one of the coolest things about it is it's not no role is equal, but, and that's important. There needs to be the hierarchy. There needs to be who reports mm -hmm. to who for what and so on and so forth. Um, and I generally believe that not everyone needs to be at the top to be happy. Not everyone needs to be a manager to be happy not, and all that kind of stuff. And so in our organization, we're constantly asking ourselves like, okay, are you in your zone of genius? Are you happy there? Are you doing what you love to be doing? If not, do we need to redeploy you, help you find another job? Because I don't want anybody working in my organization who doesn't feel like they're working in their zone of genius, no matter where you are in the, in the hierarchy. 
That's good. That makes sense. And I think you said something that, that popped out at me, which I love. Too many times people try to be what they think other people think they should be instead of, of being who they should be. So yeah, how did you get dude. confident in who you are? Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. I think that's highly subjective to the individual, obviously, because everyone has their own journey and many never find that that truth of, in and of themselves, right? Um, <clears throat> I think for me personally, <sighs> yeah, I just... I really stopped giving a shit what other people thought um, and really checked in with what I desired and trusted that if I continue vocalizing and moving towards what I desire, I will attract people who resonate. And over time, like, because I, I think back to like when I was a teenager and I was surrounded by people that I thought would, uh, I would call brothers at the time, but, and who, for example, I had one of them stay at my house when he had nowhere to go the guy ended up stealing from me and just being like, mm. you know, completely terrible in every possible way. Um, and to go from that to now, I literally have like a circle of brothers. We meet every month for four years now, six of us. Mm -hmm. um, and they are genuinely my brothers, uh, you know, and, and to go from that change, it was just like this constant belief. Like, I think I, I, I believe that I can find people I can trust. I believe I can find my wolf pack, if you will. And so it's just like, if you have a belief that many people are telling you no to, you just got to keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And eventually you'll find yourself surrounded by people who are actually like, no, that's a valid belief. You're, you're right. And then you'll find yourself in continuing to push your belief forward. At least that's what worked for me. I like that, but I want to dig a little deeper because a lot yeah, of people are like, yeah, sure, Oliver, you and Joe can go on and you can find those people and do it. How did you yeah. develop yourself personally? Because I, I know you said you were in the sweat lodge. You've done a lot of other stuff. So how did you become the Oliver that was selling Cutco to now cool. the Oliver that's the COO? How was that transition? Yeah, and I'd even go before Cutco because so I guess, yeah, we'll go to one of the things I talk about is I went from like purposeless to purposeful. Um, so I, I am actually like, I was suicidal for a couple of years. I faced death in the face, like multiple times, uh, due to it. And, you know, I was in drugs and alcohol and all those things. Uh, and really it drove me down the path of like dealing drugs and seeing that it was either going to be an early death or a prison. And eventually I just really checked in with myself. I just had this, one of these moments that was like a rock bottom moment of saying like, well, look, it's either it's this is going to end in two ways and it's going to come soon what am i really doing with myself um mm -hmm. and so when i started to become like have that self those self-awareness questions start to come up like what am i doing with myself what's the point why am i here what am i actually trying to achieve so on and so forth um it led towards those personal development questions and skipping a few chapters the key thing is and funny enough one of the biggest trigger points was actually uh, miracle morning by hal elrod you have you read that book yeah, so that was one of the first like personal development books that really triggered for me to the degree where I bought like 30 copies and got one for my mom and my sister nice. and my like uh -huh. I went off, bro. I was like, dude, this is game changing, which it still is. Um, and so that started to trickle out into many other things. Um, but ultimately, it was just it's that classic rock, my version of a rock bottom. I think everyone has their version of a rock bottom and deciding like, is this a life I want to continue to gravitate towards or am I going to make a change? Am I going to become someone different? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we all go through the different progression because I look back through my life and I started out working in a factory with mm. a family, trying to get into the management program, got laid off, fell into sales, which was kind of cool. And I did mm -hmm. sales for a while and I started getting really good at sales. So now I've progressed into sales coaching and podcasting and all that stuff. Yeah. But it was always doing the one more rep or one more little thing mm. that no one else was willing to do. Because everyone's yeah. like, always they probably say this to you. Are you you're an overnight success, Oliver? And you look back and go, I'm not an overnight success. I've done all sure. this stuff. Sure. But so how much has systems and processes played in developing your business, yourself? It sounds like yeah. you've yeah. shifted into that more. Yeah, well, and so coming back to that time where like, because I even remember uh, when I was in the teens, I like, I was like, what's the point of a watch? What's a calendar? You know, what's all these kinds of things? Now I, I live and die by my calendar and it's all very systemized and operationalized. And uh, so I think that's just one of the big things for people to recognize is if you don't manage and own your time, then your time owns and manages you. 
And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is this idea of like, because I'm very careful with the word discipline um, because it it can have some very adverse meanings to it. Uh, There are very much times where discipline is not the answer, but it's kind of a go-to, especially in the men's world and such. Um, But what I did definitely just get really good at is the power of like decision-making and what I'm deciding to do for myself. So it's like, okay, cool. I've got this idea that I want to be something better. What are the decisions I need to make now? that will allow for that. And then just continuing to make that decision every single day. And I think that's one of the big takeaways, which again, you mentioned like, Oh, staying in later, starting sooner, so on and so forth. Um, That requires making that decision every day, the power of decision, having that self integrity that you're going to trust that you're going to fulfill that. And then over time you create that confidence of like, Oh, look at that. I made a decision. I did the thing. I can trust myself a bit more, make the decision again. I did the thing. I can trust myself and you start creating like that's the person who matters the most is what do you again like do you have integrity with yourself do you believe in yourself Do you trust yourself you test yourself just every day test yourself like make a decision see if you're going to fulfill it how well did you do do it again and eventually you start to like hone not just your skill set but again your self-belief and that that to me was the biggest thing is like really creating that self-belief where one of the compliments I get from people is like man like you just seem to know what you're doing and feel confident about it And even though half the time I don't know what I'm doing, I'm confident that I'll figure it out. (laughs) So I'm always confident because I'm either going to get it right or know what to do when I get it wrong. Like you said, you you tested it out. You would Mm. set something in motion. You would try it, but you would do it for a period of time. You didn't just try it for a day or two. You like set a set period where you could see the results and go back from there. I think a lot of times people try one thing, then they jump to a new thing, they jump to a new thing, and they don't ever build that self-confidence in all. How else have you built your self-confidence? I know testing and trying, but was there any any other way that you built that up? Because you're definitely confident. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I got to lean on Hormozy. Like he just, he nails it really well when it comes to confidence, right? Like confidence is reflected by competence, right? And so at the end of the day, it's like being confident about something you're not confident at is basically delusion or some version of like just out of integrity. So number one is just get good at things, right? Take the time to, it takes to get good at things. And I mean, to the degree, and I'll give a funny example because uh, I, I think people will get too stuck on like, well, the only way to c- get confident at, uh, let's say being a COO is to become a COO and I'm not that. So what am I going to do? Um, a great example is I, I'm a gamer on the side and I played uh, a game I used to play a lot more than I do ever anymore is Smash Bros. So it's, it's a Nintendo game. And if you get competitive, it's actually legit. And there were these things you could do in the game that kind of break the game. And I was like, man, it's so cool. I wish I could learn that. And I got to a place where I like after a lot of practice to the place where I could compete. And to this day, that's a little tidbit that shows me, wow, I have the ability to do anything I set my mind to. If I see someone doing it, I can get that good too. And this is gaming, right? And so... That to me, I think is really cool. A, a powerful way to create confidence is don't get too attached to the competence you're trying to eventually create and get confident in. Get good at getting good at things. If you get good at getting good at things, if you know how you learn, that'll give you the confidence that when you're faced with the next thing, you're confident that you'll be able to figure it out. No, I love that. I think so many times people, again, they're always looking for the secret hack, the secret code. And I always jokingly say success is boring. It's doing the right process over and over, knowing the known result. And I think that's why people flip flop so much. Because like you said there again, I had to play Smash Bros. I'm a gamer as well. I'm not great at Smash Bros. I play like Skyrim (laughs) and Starfield, stuff like that. But the more you do something, the better you get. The more you learn, the more you grow. And it's any aspect of life. You mentioned Mm -hmm. it earlier. The choices we make determine our outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that I I just want to understand a little bit more because when you're making decisions and, and deciding what's good for you, how do you, how does the outside world impact around? Cause I know you have, you're a father, you have businesses, you have all this other stuff, but you said earlier, I make decisions that make sense for me. How do you, how did you get there? Cause that's kind of a mm. tougher yeah, Generally like how to make decisions and as a whole kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like what's been one of the cool practices, um, uh, the one thing, by uh geez what's his name uh jeff woods was running it for a long time 
you know the one thing? Do you know who the author was for that by any chance? Mm-mm. Fantastic book. It's, it's, uh, anyways, long story short, they have an exercise on coming up with your own personal core values. Right. So I'm going towards the core values thing and, and I'll, I have a spiel on this. Um, but I have my own personal three core values for who I am and how I operate. I have my business's core values, which allow me to see how I and my team operate. And these are the kinds of things that make decision making a lot easier. So I've determined after going through dozens and dozens of core values and connecting with myself and chatting with my wife and all that, that my three core values in order are fun, integrity, community. Right. And so those three things are what I filter pretty much every decision that I make. Because I've found in myself that if those aren't existing, I will not be happy about the decision I make. Right. If the decision I make goes against ultimately any of those three, or especially if it's two out of three, I know I'm not going to be happy about it. So that's one quick, very high level one. And again, you can do your own research. Like, how do I come up with my own personal core values? Like you can Google that and find a dozen different ways to do it. Um, that that's going to be a huge one for sure. No, I love that. So I know you mentioned Hermosis, you mentioned another book. What have been the two or three biggest books or people that have impacted you oh man um simon two or three. Is, yeah simon sinek is definitely up there like i i love his leadership principles the way he operates uh the infinite game is one of my favorite books of all time the way it just completely changes the way you think um yeah so highly recommended infinite game simon sinek uh, early on, a lot less now, but early on, John C. Maxwell and all of his leadership, I must have gone through at least a dozen of his books. Um, you know, five levels of leadership, uh, the 21 one irrefutable laws of leadership, like these are just golden <laughs> must reads. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess in terms of another influencer, potentially I'm trying to think who would be another powerful one. I mean, again, Jim Dethmer and the 15 commitments of conscious leadership like and they're all leadership like these are all leadership like for me by far the biggest thing that's made an impact on my life is just like really investing in leadership at the end of the day like that's the most valuable skill um and that can be debated in many different ways but ultimately if you're able to rally people to go into a certain direction which is ultimately what leadership is or or what john c maxwell says is like leadership is influence um then you can make things happen at scale. Hands down. <laughs> well, and, and I agree with you. I like, I've read a bunch of Maxwell's books, love Simon Sinek. I loved his Leaders Eat last book as well. Mm. I like that guy, just I vibe very well with him. He, he makes yeah. me happy. I've not read the last one, but I'm going to put it on my list now. Which one's the last one? I think one? leadership. Oh, the, or the, or no, the last, no, the last guy, the last book you said. The oh, um, I'm going to go back to yeah. the recording because mm. I haven't read that one. Yet. Conscious leadership. Yeah. Definitely. Because I think the more you develop yourself as a leader and as a human, the better you can be. Because I think mm-hmm. that everything's human connection and leading people. If you want someone to buy yep. something, if you want to build something, anything yep. you're doing, it's human connection. You need to level up. Yep. Um, you also mentioned the Miracle Morning. So are you really big mm-hmm. on like morning routines and stuff still? Or was it just at that time you had the epiphany? How, yeah. how, do, how do you operate there? Good question, and for sure. And so, again, this is one of these things that's very subjective to the individual. Nothing is like, you know rule of thumb for everyone. I think the, if anything, the only rule of thumb is like the fact that everyone has their own rule of thumb and you need yep, to really yep. check in with yourself. Like, uh, so when miracle morning, when I was in it, I was doing all the things every day for months, like a long, long time. Uh, and, and it was a huge part of my transformation, no doubt. Now it's just, I don't, I don't connect with it in that way. I don't require all those, of those things for the season I'm in and the level up I'm looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so right now my morning routine, I do have one, but it's not, again, it's not nearly as deep as that. Like I can literally read it off my calendar. It's it's very, very simple. Um, I wake up, I do a cold shower, uh, three minutes. Um, I do, I have my AG one water, like, so, uh, athletic greens. Um, and then I'll do a work session for one hour where it's it's from 6am to 7am. So it's just like un uninterrupted, nice and smooth. Uh, and then I have my, two hours with my kids. So waking them up, breakfast, you know, all that kind of stuff. Then I will take them to daycare. Then I'll do my work day. And that's like pretty much how it flows. Um, depending on some days, sometimes I'll have like a sauna session in the morning. But that's just what has come to me as feeling best for where I'm at. 
Um, mm-hmm. So am I like for or against morning rituals? It's like, it's just, again, what gets you to be in a good state. But again, one of the things that coming back to Hormozy that I do love is he talks about how like, don't get so stuck in your morning routines that if you don't have it, you can't perform. Right. So that's the thing too. I can have a day where I don't do any of what I just said and still peak perform. Mm-hmm. And that's important to me. Well, I think... I think they're good, just like 75 hard, which I've done a few times. Mm-hmm. They're good because they make you get a different perspective on life. They help you understand you're capable of doing different stuff, doing hard shit, whatever you want to say there, sure. so that you can get it set up. But like you said, you have to be adaptable. In my yes, 20 years exactly. in sales, it's changed every couple of years. My morning yep. routine right now, now that I live in Arizona, is different. I walk. Yep. When I was in Texas, I used to give and lift weight. It's just right yeah. now. I get to go see mountains. That makes my heart happy. It checks two yep. boxes for me. I need to be in nature and I need to be in exercise. So I'm just doing yep. different things. And I think. And like see that what's key is you know that work. about yourself. You're like, Hey, I need to be in nature. I need to be like, these are the things that people need to understand about. The, like, what are the things that I need to make me feel like I'm in the best state? And then how can I create an environment that allows for that to be easy or easeful, not necessarily easy. Yeah, no, no, I agree. We're not done, but I like to put it in the middle. Where can people find you? That's funny. Um, yeah, I guess the easiest place, I mean, social media is right. Oliver Wolf, um, more active on Facebook, but I'm, I'm again, as an operations guy, I'm not a big influencer type. I'm like high, t- like, like high touch with individuals, not with large amounts of people. So Facebook, but otherwise, um, yeah, no, I'll leave it at that. Find me on Facebook is the best place to go. There's yeah, obviously our website beyond the peak.co, but you know, just find me and we'll connect. Awesome. No, I love that. So I loved you said this in your routine right now that you spend two hours with your kid and you have the hat that says front row dad. What mm-hmm. does front row dad mean to you or dad? Sorry. Mean to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, do you know that front row dads is like an actual like brand and everything? Uh, no, I did not. First time I see okay, it was cool. on your head. So very cool. So you'll want to check it out because you're, if you love being a dad, you'll love this. So um, front row dads is basically it's, it's a brotherhood of men that are looking to be better fathers, husbands, and men to the world plain and simple. Um, I was in their community for, I don't know, at least two years. Um, and, and I'm still like friends with a lot of them. I'm not like a paid member at the moment, but still very connected, all that kind of stuff. Long story short, it's, it's exactly what the title is. It's front row dads. And they're my, the, the tagline is, um, generally it's, it's, uh, uh, fathers with businesses, not businesses. Uh, no, what is it? I don't know. I'm forgetting the tagline off the top of my head right now. Um, long story short though, is that most people, put their business first. They might mm-hmm. say that they won't, but their calendar would reflect differently, right? Yes. And so ultimately this whole group and what it this hat reminds me of is again, it's like, how am I showing up as a dad? Am I showing up as best I can? And at the times that I'm not, who am I reaching out to to help out? Because Lord only knows with twin four and a half year olds, shit, it's the fan. Yep, <laughs> and yep, yep. I am not trying to act like some kind of a God dad, but it's really just that like, Okay, but I have the support network if needed. I have the brothers that can lift me up if I'm down as a father and such. So. No, I love that. I love that. I try to be intentional with my kid. Um, I think I've seen this on the podcast I did before. Like I do date with them. So like I have a 21 year old now, a 19 year old, or 18 would be 19 in May, and a nine year old. And when they were little, like your kid pages, I would literally take them on dates and talk to them and be present. And mm. now like my 21 year old talks to me all the time. So no, I love that a lot. Love it. You've also said through the whole conversation, you keep going back to my brothers, my brothers, my mm. brothers. How has having the right circle of men, because I believe that's what you said, mm. impacted in your life and helped you become the person you are? Yeah, man. So instrumental. Um yeah. And, and I think about like both sides of it. Right. So again, as I mentioned earlier, like I had the opposite side of having a, someone I thought was a brother literally steal from me and just go completely the opposite direction. And then to the ones now that, that, you know, we take care of each other's kids, like we, we get together and it's just all really good. And again, we've been for over four years now meeting every single four to six weeks uh, for an incendium outdoors, always around a fire even if it's the middle of like winter cold here in Canada, <laughs> we're in the okay. middle of the snow for like four or five hours doing a men's mm-hmm. circle where every single one of us gets to share without any interruption, uh, freely and openly anything and everything that's on their like heart, mind and, and, and body. Um, and then the other men just hold it. And then afterwards we do like open reflections. We have a whole like agenda, like very systemic, but 
it's great because it's got the allowance for flow and uh and then then structure but long story short that has been so massive it's such an incredible check-in because um anyone who is in any form of a men's circle knows that it's it's there's nothing like it uh it's it's a very special sacred space where we can tap into parts of ourselves that we can't do in any other circumstance with kids, with women, with larger public environments or things like that. Like this is just a different environment where the things that we hide because we need to be the man get to mm -hmm. actually come out because we're still human, right? There's this disconnect between being a man and a human. We forget that we're still human as men. We still have feelings. We still have concerns. We still have like all these different things that we're often being told like man up, <laughs> buck up like all that kind of stuff right so yeah it's 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 been arguably definitely in the top three most important things in my life to have created any form of success no i i, I adore that i think that's huge for men because i think a lot of times men try to and i'm even use this term be the lone wolf because they don't sure. understand the power of community and i yep. know even in the past five years the people that i'm close to were not who i grew up with they're people that oh, yeah. like i've connected yep. with through podcasting, through business, through sales, through that stuff. Yep. My mind thought here though, and I love campfires and I like have like a little fire pit. Sometimes I just do regular wood. Is, yep. it, is it, does it help being in the group with just the fire kind of like old school, just you guys and fire? Like mm. does that kind of the atmosphere help you guys open up? I know that's a little tangent, a little off, but that's just- No, I think, it's, I think it's a great question. So as it relates to your specific question, like does it help us open up? I would say no. I'd say that that has everything to do with the container one sets before the beginning of, of these meetings and mm -hmm. the inherent trust that gets developed over time. And it's not like the first time you do this, it's like full openness kind of thing. Um, it, it really depends how well you guys have already connected and are intimate and so on and so forth. What the fire does do, though, is the fact that as a species, we have met around fires for millennia. <laughs> And and it is a symbol of of like g community and gathering and, and communication and so on. And the other thing that's really interesting is men uh, operate and communicate better when there's something to focus on aside from each other. Yep. So for example, a very common one is a car, right? It's very common for guys to get around a car and like they're looking at the engine, working on the engine and they're talking about stuff. And so whereas women, they actually love being very like face to face like human to human. So for, for men, if, if it's not going to be a fire, if you are in person, though, I recommend there is something that you're kind of mm -hmm. still focusing on. And that that actually creates, ironically, some level of opening more up by that logic. So again, it's not that it's it's a fire. It's it's also more that it's like just something else to focus on. Um, it's really interesting, actually. <laughs> no, I like they just intrigued me. Like I was sitting last night, we decided, my wife decided she wanted to do s'mores and hot dogs over a fire at our house. Yeah. So we just oh. got my son's little fire pit, lit it up and did it. And it's just like, I can sit for hours at a fire yep. and I'm like super happy. You sit me yep. in front of a TV for hours, I'm super annoyed. So I yeah. think it's just, you know, you got to figure out what works for you. Um, before and, I let and you- real quick, and there's there's human and like, again, just bring it back to that. Like, I don't think there's a single man, even human, I would say like, it's probably both ways. I don't, I can't speak as much to women as it relates to this, but definitely for men, like, there is something truly powerful and magical about fire. Like I don't, I haven't met a single man who can't just get stuck, stuck staring at a fire. Mm -hmm. Like it's, there is something it's truly in our veins, innate our there. Yeah. It is very much there. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about this. Cause you mentioned, like we talked about like fire, you talked about like the sauna, you talked about doing the mm -hmm. sweat lodge and all what self care, I call it self care stuff, or what type of stuff do you use to recharge? Because I'm mm. hearing it in your threads. So I don't have to ask you to recharge. I want to kind of know what's worked for you. Yeah, man. So for sure, again, the sauna is big for me personally. Um, it is such a place of solace. Uh, so for sure that um, and then what's great about it is that it's a two in one for me because when I do the sauna, I can't help but want to meditate. I have a really hard time meditating outside of a sauna, like just in a standard scenario. I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, yep. But in a sauna, I'm like inevitably the case. Um, so there's some of those classic things, obviously eating well, drinking a ton of water. Like you can see my big bottle here, like I'm drinking at least one of these a day, plus other water outside, uh, outside of this bottle kind of thing. 
Um, but I'll speak more to the things that are a little less common that I think will be potential takeaways. One is um, I'm in a volleyball team, like an actual league where we play every week. And I think, again, especially speaking to men, um, being in a competitive league is very, very rejuvenating because it's a place where we like when it's competitive, you can't help but be focused on the thing and nothing else. Right. So when I'm on the court, it's like it's the court. There's nothing else going on. If I pay attention to anything for a second, I might get a ball in the face. Right. Um, so that's another powerful one. And the other one I mentioned earlier was gaming. I, I genuinely have I have a very good relationship with gaming. And and, you know, in the past, I've been like, oh, I should stop that. Everyone says gaming is bad and da 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 da. Um, but I've come to again, like th these are these things of like getting to know yourself, getting to recognize yourself, becoming confident, all that kind of stuff of being like, no, you know what? I love gaming. I love exploring games. It's super fun. And I take the time when it makes sense to do so. And then these things give me like a much more holistic appreciation for my life. When it's waking up to a life you want to live. And like I'm a mm -hmm. gamer as well. Like I said, I play more of the role playing games and all, but it's just finding stuff more that works for you. More strategy games. It's an ops thing. Yeah, I like, <laughs> like Total War. I like Skyrim. Yeah. I like Starfield. Just only because I can go into space. It's not the greatest game, That's but funny, I can yeah. fly around. So I'm okay with it. Um, That's funny. Any other last parting words of wisdom you want to leave with our audience before I let you go? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I know ultimately, right, your whole thing is like, hey, look, getting you to six figures and beyond. Um, I think I want to impart a very important thing as it relates to that is like, what's great is getting to six figures is pretty much entirely doable by you. Um, by getting your root, we talked about routines, figuring out your routine, we talked about confidence, getting confident, like, to get to six figures and even to like mid six figures or so, depending on the industry, but generally it's like, you just got to become the best version of yourself to the best of your ability. Now, once you start crossing that mid six figures, getting to the seven figures, that's when you really, really get into like team and development of uh, like leadership development, all that kind of stuff and having people around you and, and making them better. But honestly, getting the six figures, like just master yourself. Start mastering yourself. The reality is you'll never master yourself. You're an ever-evolving creature. Every single week or month, <laughs> there's something new to learn. But really just focus on you and your business will flow uh, from there. I love that. Oliver, thank you for being on the show. And like you said, step one, get to six figures, master yourself. Step two, start building the team and grow and get to a life you want to live, whatever that looks like for you. Because at the end of the time or at the end of the day, it's your choice. Have a yep. great day, guys. We'll talk with you soon.